My name is Emily Phillips and welcome to Step to Stories. Grab your watches and grab your tennis shoes as we move our bodies and get inspired. Today, we're going to be talking to a dear friend of mine, Andy. Andy is so amazing in so many ways. Andy has battled with alcoholism her entire life. She is a true survivor. Andy was in the dark. Andy struggled. She hit rock bottom. And she's going to talk to us about all of that, about feeling love and acceptance and all of the emotions. There's so much to this story. And you really can replace this addiction with any addiction. If you're like me, I battle addictions. You know, there's gambling, there's shopping, there's food, there's alcohol, there's drugs, there's smoking. Anything that takes over your mind, body, and soul and doesn't allow you to be the best version of yourself, that's an addiction. But you know what? There's hope. And we can quit. We can stop. And we can move ahead. And we can beat this. And I think by listening to stories like this, it's just truly inspiring for the person out there that is struggling right now and is not feeling hope and is getting up and doing the same thing over and over again and wanting different results but not being able to achieve it. Just listen to Andy. She's here for you. She wants to help. That's why she's sharing her story and being so vulnerable. And I hope this inspires some of you. And go ahead and put in the comments if you are struggling or battling, or maybe you have overcome your own addiction and would like to share with us because we would love to have you. So let's get up. Let's get stepping. And let's listen to Andy tell us all about how she went from the darkness to the mountaintop. Hey, everybody. Emily Phillips here with another episode of Step to Stories, and I am lacking in the steps today because let's see where I'm at right now. Gosh, I'm at 1,500 steps, y'all, and I need to be at uh, 10,000, and that's what we're going to aim to get to tonight. But I have a very dear friend of mine on the line tonight. Her name is Andy V. We're going to call her Andy V, specifically talking about alcoholism tonight. Um, whether you are an alcoholic, whether you are a functioning alcoholic, a non-functioning alcoholic, binge drink, if you change in any way when you drink, usually that means there is a problem. Um, for some people, they may not drink for several months and then go on a bender. That's one form of alcoholism. Uh, for others, they drink from the second they wake up to the second they go to bed. Um, others drink very heavily on the weekends. Um, and some people drink a couple of glasses of wine every single night. Um, so there's all forms of alcoholism. Um, but we're going to talk to Andy tonight. There is hope. But you can, you can insert any addiction, really. And mm -hmm. what we're going to be discussing tonight, whether it be food, whether it be shopping, sex, gambling, alcoholism, drugs, pornography, codependency, you name it. Um, so how are you today? I'm good. I'm actually good. I went to a meeting. I'm in 12 step recovery. So I went to a meeting and uh, needed it. It was a little bit nutty, but a friend of mine actually celebrated two years sober. So we went to lunch. And so that was sweet. And Very then cool. back to the grind and doing, doing the work, which I'm grateful to have a job. Very but cool. Running into the evening and I'm like, I want to visit with Emily. I got to get this done. Got to get this done. So, and when you're talking, I want you to pretend that you're talking to like a classroom so that you're, cause you have this beautiful little voice and I want everybody to hear you because I've got a loud mouth. They can hear me, but I want them to really hear you because I'm going to be stepping here in a minute and you're going to be talking. So I want you to really project your voice. So I'm going to start. Um, let's start from the very beginning. Now, obviously some people are born with alcoholism in their family. They choose not to drink, so they don't become alcoholics. Um, so let's talk about your story. How did this all start? And tell us about your rock bottom. Tell us about your aha moment. And where are you today? And tell us everything because we got a lot of people on here that can really use your help. Yeah, no, absolutely. I um, I pulled my computer a little closer to me. I think the mic's, you know, a little far away. So, you know, I will speak loud and clear and, and try to articulate pretty clearly. Um, you know, first of all, thanks a lot for having me. It's it's really a great opportunity to um, to to share, and it helps me. Sometimes I catch myself when I'm saying some things, thinking I need to work on that and do those things a little more than even I'm just talking about. So it's an honor and a privilege. So thank you, Emily. I appreciate you asking me to to come on. Um, 
You know, when I was young, I was raised in a household. I was raised in the city, uh, DFW, and, and I was raised in a household that was very normal. There was no drugs, no drinking, no violence, no anything out of the ordinary in our home. My parents were kind of the beaver cleaver parents. I went to, you know, softball. I was a brownie. There wasn't anything like drinking behind the, you know, in the alleyway out of a paper bag. There was no anything like that in my family. So for all intents and purposes, I thought we were what would be the normal setting on a washing machine. Normal. That's about it. You know, um, my sister is quite a few years older than me and was graduating you know, high school about the time that I was entering um, the, the last year of elementary school. So we were, I was pretty much an only child, you know, um, normal kid, normal family life. And you know, what happened was when I was 11 years old, I was really close with my father and, and my father died in his sleep. He was 49 years old. He was young and he died in his sleep. And that's when my entire world changed. And I didn't know that at the time, but it wasn't until I, I finally ended up getting sober that I look back and think, that was the catalyst that changed me after that, after, and being 11 years old, there was a time where, you know, I just didn't fit in anymore. No group of people, no club, no Brownie, no, there was no more extracurricular activities. We, my my mom was, you know, doing the best she could to, to, to raise, to continue to finish raising my sister and, and me. But there wasn't any drinking in our home. So I didn't really have any access to that. It wasn't a thought. My problem at that time was feeling love and getting attention and not have, having any more in the next few years that example in those formative years of tween time where we see how parents or adults treat each other in a relationship. I didn't have that. So I didn't necessarily know, um, you know what I was looking for, but I needed, needed somebody to love me. And um, I can I look back now and realize there's some codependency there for certain, maybe some addiction to needing love or wanting to feel loved. Um, my mom did the best she could with what she had, and I don't fault her at all for that. Um, it is what it is. But my life changed when I started running around with those kids back in the day. And some of you may or may not remember, but we used to hang around the mall we yeah. were kind of mall rats, you know, yeah. with our heads head shaved and got, you know, Doc Martens on and whatever. And I had immediately began to work into this manipulative stage where, hey, negative behavior and attention, if it was getting me attention and it wasn't good, it was still attention. I needed my mother's approval. I needed validation. I needed someone to love me because the man that I looked like. I had a very healthy, pure relationship, father-daughter relationship. I needed that void to be filled. And, you know, I always say when I'm giving a talk elsewhere in 12-step recovery and different people will ask me to come, you know, talk or give us, you know, give tell my story. And I always say, I didn't have a drug problem, except I was drugged to church on Sunday and Wednesday. <laughs> so every Sunday and Wednesday, I was drugged to church. And, um, you know, that was it. And I was raised in, in organized religion and I don't have any problem with that. Um, I didn't have any, you know, any uh, unfortunate issues that others may have experienced in those years and, and times in their life. So, I, you know, I got to a place where I wasn't living the way that my mother and uh, my sister were. And so I was sinning by the time I was 12 years old. And so I decided to go on and go that route. And I continued down that route at about 13 have an older brother, two older brothers that have both since passed. But at the time I went to stay with my older brother, I was about, I think 13, almost 14 years old. I was going into the seventh grade and went out there and um, down, he lived at the time down in Burleson, that area, Cleburne. And I went down there and stayed with him. And that was the first time that I drank alcohol. He took me to the beer store and bought me these little Budweiser's, probably a little eight pack of these mini Budweiser's. And I always say now, you know, if he didn't known then what I turned out to be, he had just bought me a 40 ounce and called it a day. <laughs> but um, that was the first summer after I had been sexually abused by somebody I knew I'd known for a long time and, who, you know, friends with the family. And and that's sometimes how it happens. And so I hadn't told anybody and and I didn't have to once I drank. I just I felt OK. I would finally become OK in my own skin. Because I'd never felt the same after my dad died. I always felt like 
if all of us here were standing in line at the end of the conveyor belt, the yellow shirt was coming off out of, you know, out of a machine and they were all the same color yellow and we all put them on. Mine was a different color yellow. For some reason, I never felt like I fit in. In junior high and high school, I wasn't into sports. I, I never had the clothes or the money or the popularity. I just was like, I just didn't fit in anywhere. And now I wasn't going to church. My friend selection was rather slim. Um, so after I spent that summer with my brother, you know what? I was introduced to a substance that changed the way I felt. And I felt pretty good. I felt like the adult I had been pretending to be. So I was doing anything I could to get my hands on it. So by the time I was 16 years old, I was running around with a girlfriend of mine and we were drinking pretty heavily. And I don't know if you saw recently, Emily, on the news. I think it was yesterday, the day before the Cadillac down there in Northside burned. And um, that bar was one of the best bars there were. And I hung around that Cadillac bar and I was 17 years old on the north side of Fort Worth and um, the stockyards. And I'll tell you what, that was just the biggest part of my week. If it started on Wednesday, it probably ended on Sunday. And, and that's not, it's not real, not one of those things you come to school and talk about. Having, um, and of course, this was in the nineties, you know, and just, it was just things were different. It, it, it's so funny. I look back, it's already been almost 30 years, it seems 28 years, but um, that's really when my drinking kicked off. And um, from there, I, uh, I started working as, as fast as I could. When I turned 18, I started working as a bartender, as a beer girl on the golf course. Ironically, I did, when, that. I did that. I'm Hey, you know what? I, I was cuter then, had a lot more energy. I think we could stand the heat back then yeah. too, you know, get our tan lines on with our little, you know, golf outfit. And you know what? I put myself in positions where I could make money. It was legal and I could sell it to you and I became better looking and you tipped me and I got a drink too. And it was just all the way around. It was a good deal. <laughs> it worked out really well for me. And so I, um, for years, I kind of hung around in those type of environments and I wasn't a very good employee. I'll be, you know, just to be a hundred percent candid throughout this entire talk, I'll tell you, I was never really a good employee because I always was obsessing about drinking. I was always obsessing. And you made a comment earlier, Emily, you talked about whether it was like genetic or like, you know, inherited or, you know, and some of that's always open for question. And some people will deny it. Some people will die on that hill. You know, my father drank. Uh, he quit, you know, several years before I was born. His mother drank. His father drank. My brother drank. My sister that's still living doesn't drink. Um, both my brothers who have since passed, you know, drank. So, you know, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree in my family for me. But that's not everybody's situation. Um so I like to think that, you know, perhaps there were some of those those um, wires already crossed. When I think I I've also heard it kind of skips a generation because if you saw your parents drink a lot, you may not. Yeah, that's true. And I do have friends that way. I do have friends and I have, you know, I'm not married now. I have dated. I, I actually see somebody now seriously, but before recently. Um, I have some met some folks and they're like, yeah, I don't drink. You know, my father was a, this or my mother was that. And so just by choice. And I'm thinking, you know, I wish I'd been that lucky. It didn't start that way for me to where I was like 17 and I was already alcoholic. That's not anything I think any of us signed up for or like check the box when we talked to the counselors. I just, you know, I just it, it, it made me feel good. And it made, I drank myself good looking, you know, as we finished high school, I barely finished high school, barely. By the way, I had a boyfriend in high school who was several, well, a few years older, maybe five, too much at that age. But, you know, there was sexual violence going on throughout that entire relationship. And there was domestic violence, if you will, or, or definitely abusive behavior. I wouldn't say domestic because we weren't cohabiting at that age, but that's when I was first learning that, you know, well, he loves me. This is incorrect, you know, self-taught, I guess, or taught the wrong way. But I was I was learning to love him regardless and stick by him, even though he was mean to me or he was abusive or he was sexually violent. I loved him anyway. And, you know, I just. I isolated and alienated myself from school events because I, it was more important to be with him because if I wasn't with him, he would potentially be with somebody else. I mean, that's how sick I was. So we drank. 
Now, Andy, when you drank, were you kind of just a little buzz throughout the day? Was it to blackout or did that progress? It progressed. You know, it, it's funny you say that because I remember I left home at 20. Um, you know, I was still working in the bars. I left home at 20 to live with someone. The relationship in high school ended and um, and I, my drinking started to take on a little bit different. You know, I used to, I mean, probably by the time I was 21, really and truly, it wasn't about getting ID'd because I'd been in the bar since I was 16, you know, so it wasn't about being legal now. It was about my drinking went from, and I was just talking about this, I swear it was yesterday, but I was just talking about it in the meetings. I do go to 12 step meetings. I drink to oblivion and I drank so much so fast that I rarely remember being buzzed. I now, mean, you think you had an allergy to it? Yeah. When it describes it in some of our literature in 12 step, um, it talks about the allergy and there's a phenomenon of craving that happens. And so when you're craving and you're craving and you're craving it and like I'm at a baby shower and all these people are opening gifts and I'm thinking vodka, 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 vodka. I can't think of anything else. And I get to my car or my purse. By the time I quit drinking, it had been five years that I since I had a sober breath. But I, you know, through my 20s and then mid 20s and going on into 30, it was it was immediate allergy. As soon as I consumed it, I had to have more. If I couldn't go all the way into oblivion, I remember there being probably a handful of times. If I couldn't get drunk, I didn't drink. Because, so from what I understand, one drink is too many. And a thousand, not enough. A thousand's not enough. Yep. We're on the same page. Right. Exactly what, right. Can you explain to the viewers, what does that mean? Do what? Can you explain to the viewers, what does that mean? Um, that means when I take one drink, it's really the first drink that gets me drunk. Because when I, when I drink one, you know, I go out with friends who are moderate drinkers, right? And they can have one or two martinis or they have one or two whatever, one and they leave it on the table. When I took one drink, one, not even finished it, just a sip, it was like this warm euphoric feeling that would come between my cheeks and my ears and I could take this deep breath and I finally felt okay with whatever it was, wherever I was, and then I couldn't stop. So it was like four drinks later, seven drinks later, 12 drinks later. Now, now, you know, because I'm on my bike, it has a flat, but I'm only on drink 24. I'm only on drink 12, whatever night of the week it is. I'm in between bars, you know, around the DFW area, real shady, not high end bars because um, I can barely afford to pay for it because I can't keep a job that's worth a crap, you know. I'm not moving on with my cohorts from high school that have careers and families and, and educations. I'm still in the bars, right? I'm still with the losers. I'm picking low hanging fruit. And so, so when I you have, ask, Andy, I have a question. Yep. I've been told and then I correct me if I'm wrong. When you have an addiction at this young age, your brain stops maturing for a bit. And when you get sober, you're back where you were when you got sober takes a while to catch up. Is that accurate? Yeah. Cause I'll tell you that I, that's a hundred percent correct. And a lot of us say that, but then we realize it because by the time that I did get to the, you know, the rooms of, of recovery, I was 31 uh, and then I turned 32 and but I had started drinking heavily at 17. So the life choices I was making in my thirties, even in sobriety, my life choices the, the people I was choosing to be around, my responses to normal things that regular average people did were not the same. So basically, you're exactly right. My emotional maturity was at like 17 years old. I mean, and it's taken and I've been sober now, by the grace of God, uh, since March 13 of 2009. Ooh, so, I remember when you came out on Facebook. Yeah, like, for, yeah, like it's been 14 and, you know, three quarters and a couple days, but who's counting? No, but yeah. We um and we celebrate those milestones, right? Like anybody else does. That that birthday is bigger to me. We call it a birthday is bigger to me than my, you know, my belly button birthday. That's what we call our birth date. Um, but you know, I just to rock along really quickly and to kind of fast forward, you know, through my twenties I dated, and when that broke up, I dated again, 
or I married. And then that relationship had an ultimatum. You're either going to quit drinking or this marriage isn't going to work. Well, it's been nice knowing it. I mean, that's how bad it was. Here's a life with a safe man after terrible abuse and terrible situations. Here's a life of safety in a nice home and an environment. Or here's a life of not sure what's going to happen next or what you're going to do or where you're going to go or where you're going to live or how you're going to survive. But there's always going to be alcohol. Well, I took the alcohol. I mean, that's that's sick. That's emotionally, spiritually, mentally just sick, illness sick, you know, and the things that I survived at a high level, like at this point, you know, it, it, I'm always happy to answer questions, you know, offline, right. And, and to have private conversations, but I experienced domestic violence. I, you know, married into that. Uh, it was an old, um, I've lost two children by the hands, you know, one of them by the hands of someone. Um, I moved on in, into a more safer space by myself for a while, still drank, met a man, beautiful relationship, a safe guy, the guy on the white horse. And we were going to marry. And I was probably 26, I think, no, 20, 23, maybe 24 at the time, 24. And, um, and he walked in my bedroom in my home down in Granbury and he shot himself in the head in my bedroom. And I was there. And, uh, we had all just been out drinking and him and me went back to my house and he just shot himself and no question, no suicidal thought, no, nothing. I never knew where that came from. So I'd survived all this trauma. Then here comes the guy on the white horse. And I'm like, cause I'm, if that might save me or he might save me, cause I didn't yet know I had a problem with, with alcohol. So it was always like the next shiny thing. And I was already studying to be a paramedic. So I did go to work on the ambulance and I was um, a volunteer firefighter. And so I actually gave him CPR and he lived and then he died. I came back and then he died on the helicopter um, on the way to um, Harris downtown. And so my heart was broken and I drank over that for like seven years. And I hurt a lot of people uh, in a lot of ways, but ma mainly myself. When you were drinking over that, did you sort of like give yourself permission to drink because that happened to you? hundred percent. And I used that and I used my father's death at 11 and I used being abused or beaten. I used people, circumstances, situations. And the reality is I used those as excuses verbally, but internally I didn't drink because of that. I drank anyway. And so that's the difference. I didn't drink because he died. I was already going to drink. I just, like you said, I used it as an excuse. I used it as a crutch for a long time, seven I remember, more years. I remember having a session with one of my uh, business coaches and we're talking about my, my brother passing away. And I was telling him how I just, you know, it's how it's affected my life so much. And I remember him saying, give your brother a break. You know, like this is not, this is your life. Yes. It, his passing it does not give you permission to drown. And, and so I can totally relate. So now it's been seven years and you're continuing to drink. Oh, yeah. And now I'm moved out to East Texas and now I'm working on the ambulance. And, I, and I'm thinking, well, these cops would just leave me alone because I'm living in this town. But it's a city I'm living in. And I'm ridiculously the poster child for the mad you know, mothers against drunk drivers. I'm getting pulled over and the state troopers, because I'm an EMS, are letting me go. And, you know, it's just awful. I'm showing up for work late and leaving early to make up for it. I'm barely making my shifts. Then they, they don't let you drive an ambulance if you have, you know, if you have to have a breathalyzer on it. They're not going to put a breathalyzer on the ambulance. So they were like, you're on furlough until you get that solved. So are you even having time to have hangovers or is it like the Nicolas Cage in Vegas movie? Like, is it, it's, Just so you're really not even, never you're not, that. so you're not ever even able to ride that pink cloud because you're in the fog the entire time. I feel like crap every day. I had put on so much weight of just bloat my hair at the time. You know, it's grown long over the years, but I cut it short a couple of years ago during COVID and it's just easy. It sets in. So, I'm, you know, I was for I seven more years, I think it was. Well, no, that was the year 2000 that he died. So nine more years, almost eight and a half nine more years. This time, did you ever say, I got I to stop? 
Or did yeah. you ever say, I got to go to a meeting? Or did you ever call to reach out? Or did you ever have moments of like, what is happening? No. Never. Pure denial. Absolutely 100% denial. People will sometimes say, oh, Andy, you're full of crap. You know, you, you had to know. No, what I heard was if you'll just drink after, you know, nine or, hey, maybe just don't mix, you know, beer before liquor, never been sick or, you know, or just don't do wine after whatever. You know, I had heard all that. Like I heard all of that. And I was like, you know, I'm just not the one guys. Like I'm not the one. I turned into this person that came out of a regular blue collar family my sister went on to, to culinary school and she didn't end up working as a chef, but she had a great life, married, has a child. You know, I'm I've gone through relationship to relationship to relationship, still needing someone to love me and to accept me. And, and by the way, they need to be able to facilitate my drinking because they need to be drinkers. And if they're not drinkers, we're not we're not going to work. I mean, that's just the bottom line, because I needed them to, to be OK with me drinking. And then what you know, what really happened was I got off the ambulance. I went to work for um, somebody I knew from junior high was very random. They lived out up in, in, in East Texas in a little small town. And I went to work for his wife and he and him. And then I got married ag again. And, um, you know, I had two marriages and two divorces. I had an annulment. Um, uh, and I had another annulment when I was like 19. So, you know, it's funny because I date a guy now. It's totally off topic. But he's like, okay with it. He knows my story. And I'm like, well, the, the third time's a charm. The first two don't count, you know, they were annulled. And so, you know, we kind of joke because he's also in recovery, but what happened truly was that I never knew I had a problem. Everybody else did. I drank to oblivion all the time. People like if I were going out with, let's just say you and me were going out with a couple of girlfriends, you all would have a couple of drinks. I would already be, I like to say a soup sandwich. I would already be a just a syrup sandwich. Yeah, so, so alcoholics, from what I understand, will drink before the drink. Oh, and when I go to the bathroom and I'm like, Emily, I'll be right back. I go to the bar and I pay cash and I shoot a couple shots. Then I come back from the bathroom and sit down and then I'm okay to deal with just the little drink we're sipping. I remember we're the movie Leaving Las Vegas. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. I'll never forget one of the scenes that crossed my mind a lot is when he's going to sign his check. He can't sign his check. He runs to the bar. He downs and he comes by and he goes, hey, baby, I'm ready to sign. And he's toasting everybody. And it was like, it was like that drink made him be able to transform into a normal human being. That's what I was saying was earlier, like everybody got a handbook to life that I didn't get. I don't know why I felt insecure. I don't know why, why my wires weren't like connected. Right. Like all of us got that same yellow shirt that came off the conveyor belt. I was you know, saying that earlier, but mine was like neon and y'all's was yellow. I don't know why. I mean, like Emily, I got a letter one time from Walmart and they asked me not to come back. If you get a letter from Walmart asking you not to come back, you got a problem. I'm totally fine with that, but that's okay. Like I know, right? Like I don't do it. I, I just can't do Walmart. But at the end of the day, you know, but I you got know, a letter. Like, know, don't. The reason why is because you're here right now and you're maybe helping somebody that's listening. And I believe truly that God let you go through that so that you could help other people. I truly believe it. I do too. And the thing is, as we know, you know, those of us who are believers, and if you're not, you have your own higher power, your own thought, you know, process and whatever it is your faith is, you know, with my relationship with God, I believe we have free will. So he allowed me. You're exactly right. He allowed me. I mean, he doesn't have just puppet strings on any of us. Like I went down the path I did and it is only by the grace of God. I didn't die. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't hurt anybody. I have a friend right now, right now, a young man who I see weekly, a couple times a week with his head down and um, he's got a manslaughter charge on him for drunk driving. I know two other men that killed, one killed his boss, another man killed another, you know, and they've served their time and they're doing, I mean, I am very lucky. It isn't blessed. It's lucky because it is self-will. It is, it is free will. You know, but what happened with me was 
I did all these things and, and things kept happening. And then I did more things and, you know, and I went through jobs and just, I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I never knew how I would, you know, I had survived all this trauma. And then I went to work in trauma. I wasn't making any money, but I thought I was getting to put my hands on people, which made up for the the loss of life of the man that I truly loved and who was safe. You know, I divorced these two men because they gave me an ultimatum and I chose alcohol. I didn't have any children. And, and I moved back here to DFW and I'm living at my mom's house. I'm living and, and drinking out of the closet. I'm not living in the closet, but I'm drinking out of it. Um, living in her house, I should say. And I am drinking a handle of vodka every two days. I'm sick. I'm not eating well. I'm bloated. My hair is just like straw and it's fallen out. I was going to say that earlier when I was talking about my hair. But I mean, I'm just anxiety and depression totally just this shell of a woman. I don't, and I, I'm not even a lady by any stretch, not going to church, don't have any relationship with God, barely have a friend left in the world. One girl that I had known since, you know, junior high was hanging around and another kind of far out, but you know what? I, um, I went out, I got a job and, um, And I went out one night and it was a two day project at my little job. And the first day kicked off without a hitch. And so just like a good, you know, good alcoholic, I went and got drunk and and I got pulled over on the way home. And back then it was March of 09. They had just recently passed this thing in Arlington. I was living in Arlington at the time. I was in this like right on the edge of Fort Worth, Arlington and um pulled over and there was a man laying in the road. So I pulled over to help him and he pops his head up and he like sticks his head in my truck and he's like, Hey, can I use your phone? And you know, I don't know about you guys, but like when you're really heavily drinking or you've had a few, everybody's good people. Oh uh, yeah. Come over here and join us. We, yeah, we go way back. Everybody's good. You know? Well, this guy was like, he's good people here. He can just use my phone. Well, little did I know. I mean, not a minute later, this man's using my cell phone and the, red and blue lights are behind me. And I'm like, are you serious? I'm just trying to help a good Samaritan. Why am I getting pulled over? I'm already pulled over. I thought I was on the shoulder. I was in the middle of the road, stopped. I didn't know. Um, anyway, they take that man in and they cuff me. I fight him. They, you know, I get maced. They pull blood from me at the hospital, Arlington or whatever had just passed the law where they could take your blood upon suspicion if you wouldn't blow. And I was never going to blow for them. And Anyway, the man was wanted for like heinous crimes. I mean, Emily, the man was on the run, like a a crazy felon, heinous crimes. And the police got him. That was a lot. That was God saving me. I went to jail for when that man that was laying in the taken you. He could have taken me anywhere. He could have cut my throat. He could have thrown me in the ditch. The police lit me up, handcuffed him because he started running. And then they came back for me. And that man was wanted for crimes, like unspeakable. And was that your... Was that your day? That was the last time I had a drink. And I went to jail that night on March the 12th of 2009. And I made the decision the next morning, March 13th, when I woke up in the drunk tank, all sprayed and maced. My face was, you know, bloated and blinded in the eyes almost, you know, and swollen. And I made the decision. I didn't want to drink anymore. And I I don't know where except for from God that it came. But um, this very, very, very slight glimpse and then we call it a moment of clarity. I'm sure you're familiar with that term. Just a moment of clarity came when the jailer, she was this little woman. She was really short and she was really wide and she had these keys and she was swinging them around. Well, anyway, she, she came over to the jail, you know, cell and there were several other people in there, several other women in there. And I remember saying, ma'am, can I use the restroom? And she's like, there's one behind you. And I was like, yeah, that's not going to work for me. I mean, like thinking I'm all better than that. Like, well, that's not going to work for me. And so anyway, she looks at me and she says, you disgust me. And I was like, really taken aback, you know, like, like, what are you to me? You know, like, like your opinion matters. In this moment of clarity I was talking about, I heard her. She said, you disgust me because you have so much potential and you're just wasting it. And I, I don't know why I heard her or how, but she did let me go to the restroom. I go in there, I look in the mirror and um, it's like a funny farm mirror. So you can't hurt yourself or others. And I don't know the woman looking back at me. So I get out of jail. My mom picks me up 
And what happens next is I say, I need to go to a meeting or to rehab. I'd never been to a meeting. I didn't know or like what that meant, but I think maybe Schick Shadel commercials or something when we were younger. I, I don't know. Maybe I had taken a college class in psychology at some point, you know, after high school, but dropped out, N- never finished anything I started, didn't have a degree, didn't have anything, um, barely, barely had a job. And by the way, this job that I had, I had to have my mother call me in sick because I was too incapacitated, inebriated, sick. My truck was in the tow, you know, yard. We had to go get that. And just a mess. Thank God that my mother continued to enable me, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, but help me. Um, and you know what? I, uh, I went home because I had rented my own house by this time, a few months after having lived with my mom. And I lived in East Arlington and I called on my desktop computer. We didn't have many laptops and it was still dial up internet. Yeah. Ago. It's crazy, but we, we didn't have high speed. It's come along pretty quick. And um, I got like 1-800, you know, AA or whatever it was, and, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know what? I called and then I went to a meeting and my life, it was two days later and I went to a meeting because I detoxed at home. I would not suggest that of anybody. If, if you're in a very you know sticky situation, you need help medically, it's necessary. It is necessary. But I went to a meeting and um, my life started to change. I mean, almost immediately because I, I decided that it wasn't going to fail me. 12 step wasn't going to fail me and, and God wasn't going to fail me. I developed redevelop this relationship with the God I knew in church on my own. Um, You know, the first step being powerless, second step, realizing there's a higher power and third step, trying to let him help you. Um, Got a woman to help me. I moved into a group over in Arlington at the time, three months later, um, where there was a woman that could be available. There weren't very many at the first group I went to. And, you know, exponentially my life changed. I started to become humble. I pocketed my ego and my pride, this bravado that I had, that I could handle it. I could take it on, whatever it was. I stopped dating. I stopped looking at men to solve my solution and stopped trying to plug food and this and that and booze and cigarettes. I smoked for 20 years. Um, I stopped shoving all that into this hole in me. And I allowed the, the 12 steps of the program to come to life. I worked them hard, hard, hardcore. And I was probably a year and a half sober, maybe. And I went back to school. I usually get teary eyed, you know, when I'm given the, this part of my talk sometimes. Um, I went back to school and I was in my 30s and uh, I graduated uh, with an undergraduate degree at UTA. And then I went on and got a master's degree and a real estate license. And I kept a job. And I got a little bit better job and a little bit better. And I went from living in this life. I mean, Emily, I would drive down the road, go to the boats in Shreveport before Windstar was really a thing, but I'd go to the boats and I would be passed out. I'd black out. I'd go to the bar in Fort Worth and end up in Dallas asleep in an alley. I would have my dogs and my cat and my truck with me. I mean, it was just this, I slept with my dogs because I'd fall asleep on the back porch or in the garage with them. I mean, just, And here I am working one job after another and climbing and climbing and climbing. And I was working in a place once where I was actually responsible um, for 27 men on the ground in 300 different buildings that I managed in 10 states. And I led them with dignity and with grace and, and they respected me. And I didn't make them pay for the mistakes of my past. And that was a huge first. I love how you say dignity and grace. We have so many comments right now. One of them says, well, they're all saying hi. And then one of them says, striving for approval can be detrimental to our health. I relate to this so deeply, feeling like you don't fit in. Somebody asked, were there stretches of time that you did not drink? Yes, there were. The The stretches of time were when, here's what we say a lot of times, my friends and me, is when I was controlling it, I wasn't having any fun. And if I was having any fun, I wasn't controlling it. That's pretty common. But if I couldn't get loaded completely, I didn't drink at all. Like, for example, if I was going to drive a long way and I still had conviction, like, right, like I still some of us. Now, I won't say they lost their conviction or their moral compass, but I had something in me that was like, you don't drink on the job. So there would be days or weeks that would go by where I wouldn't drink. Then I would have bottles in my house and I would count with my fingers how much I drank. 
you know, and then I would mark the bottle or I would hide the bottle. And then I would try not to drink. I would really try not to drink. And then I would buy this just, just disgusting bottle of wine that tasted awful. And if I really thought I needed a drink because I had had a bad day, I would drink that and it would just be gross. So I would throw it out. Somebody says, Shelly says, one of my friends, it's so amazing how connected I feel to you. And I don't have alcoholism, but it speaks to me. I wonder why. You know why? Because I understand what happens is a number. Well, let me finish telling you this really fast. And then I'll answer what Shelly just said. What happens, what happened to me was that I started to develop self-esteem by working the steps with a sponsor, with a woman who'd been through the steps before I developed a little bit of self-esteem. I work with this woman now. She's my sponsor. She's been my sponsor for 12 years, even though I've been in program 14 and almost a half, but the first one went back out and she drank, unfortunately went to the penitentiary and the second lady died with 47 years. So then I've been with this woman a long time, but you know what? I identified with what the woman shared just because of her vulnerability and like kind of, I always say like I unzip and I can come out and I can just tell you the truth and say like, I'm broken, I'm wounded, I was embarrassed, I didn't fit in. And where the magic happened for me was talking to another woman who could say these things that I'm saying. And, and yes, there's a little tiny titch of shame still left back there. The meat men sleep because that's what I did. I drank, I got with people, I needed you to love me. I would hang on to you. I would take you hostage and make sure you loved me because if you loved me, I was okay with myself. No matter who you were or what you were, I mean, don't get me wrong, men are my preference. Everybody has their own. I loved the fact that they wanted me even if I didn't want them. And then what would happen was 12-step recovery and I'm working these steps and I'm learning like what my part is or how I need to change and I'm starting to develop a little self-esteem. I'm starting to change. And then my sponsor says, you need to read a book. Steve Harvey wrote it. Act like a lady, think like a man changed everything about the way I date. Then another book, why men love bitches. I hate that word, but she means it to be synonymous with strong uh, women. I'm telling you, my life changed from doormat to quote dream girl, but I soared strongly, not really by like easy flight, but strongly soared from being this bottom of the barrel, choosing low hanging fruit men to like me, no self-esteem to where I faked it. That's what happened. I faked it until I had it. And I don't always have a lot of self-esteem. I don't always feel like I have self-worth. I- what was the last book called? The last book, Why Men Love Bitches. I hate that word, but it's a, it changed my life. It changed my life because you know what? When I get a text message from a man um, or anybody, I don't immediately respond before he's done typing his bubbles. I don't immediately hurry up and do whatever it is he wants to do. You know, my my second sponsor. My that reminds sponsor. me of that book, Remember the Rules. I don't know if I read it. That no. was when we had... Um, um, it was called the rules. Very similar though. Uh, well, I'll tell you. Yeah. Here's the, I'm right. Short down. Here's the thing. My sponsor told me her name was Dion. I can call her I mean, Dion. She passed. Dion would say, if your date is 15 minutes late, you don't chase him down and ask him where he is. If he's not responded to you, you turn off your porch lot and go on with your life as if you never had plans. I love that. That's a shocker because I need you to like me. I need to people please. I need to make sure you like me because I'm afraid if you don't, you're going to talk about me and you're not going to like me. And that still happens today, but not as bad because I've developed boundaries, you know, little by bit, little by bit. And I'll tell you, I climbed walls of ice with no fingernails to get to better jobs, get to better places. You know, I, I was quiet and I was humble and I listened as opposed to when you call me on the phone, you're like, hey, what's going on? I didn't just take you hostage and go, oh, I'm doing fine. So blah, 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 blah. I would be like, I'm OK. What's going on with you? I stopped talking about me for a change. I stopped needing to be in the limelight. I stopped having to have everybody know my shit. I stopped hanging all my laundry out and letting everybody see it so that they would feel sorry for me. I stopped being an offender from the victim position. That is what I stopped doing. I did not know that I was offending you and then acting like a victim. I had no idea because I came in with this skewed sense of perception from a mother who did the best she could with what she had, having survived all this crappy stuff, some organized religion messages that just didn't fit well with me. 
And then I go to sponsorship, develop a relationship with this God of my understanding, which is the carpenter, thank goodness. And I have a relationship as an adult, develop some self-esteem. I figure out like, you know what, Andy, you are loud. You're a little bit bodacious and, and grandiose and this and this and this. Some character defects, you know, you're lazy, you're late, you're all these things. And then I'm like, all right, I want to change these things. How do I do that? Do you, know, you still, do you still get urges to drink, Andy? No, I don't. And the reason why I don't get urges to drink is because I ask God every morning since March 13, 2009 to remove the obsession. And at night I thank him. Sometimes I fall asleep. So maybe not every night. Sometimes I've just passed out in the chair in the living room or whatever from a good movie, but no, nine, the first nine months of sobriety I did, but the urge to drink is different than the thought. And I'll say that and maybe that's what was meant by the question, but maybe not. Um, if I was a baker and I abused my hands and I needed dough, you know, for 15, 17 years, and by broke both my hands, I'd still think about baking. So for me not to ever think about alcohol would be a lie. You know, I see Tito's commercials. I didn't drink Tito's. I see this Rancho or Ranch drink or whatever it's called. Ranch something. Y'all know what it's called. Uh, ranch water. I don't know what that tastes like. I mean, I'm the Smirnoff and the Zima girl. You know, I remember those were the big thing. And I didn't like those. I drank turkey. I mean, that's and crown straight and vodka. But, you know, one, every once in a while, you know, some of my friends and me will joke like, I wonder what that tastes like. Or, and you know what? I have been out and I've asked whomever I'm with to smell because I'm like, All right, will you taste this? Because I really don't want to put myself, you know, in a precarious situation. So do you not even use Listerine? Oh, I do. I do. But I didn't for about five years. Somebody I didn't. asks, what do you say when you wake up in the morning? I say, uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for waking me up this morning. Um, please keep me sober and cigarette free, nicotine free now that I don't chew nicotine. And I say, please help me to be patient, kind and tolerant. And please help me be an example of, of you and how I can be of service to you and to others. It's almost a scripted prayer. But then I'll say like that we have a, what we call the third step prayer, several different prayers. But I it depends on where I am. Please help me feel good. Please help me be kind to Sally, Joe, Bill, whoever's on my nerves at night. I thank him for keeping me sober and cigarette free. And then I pray for the people who are on my left side list in my mind and the people who are on my right side are the people who I can't stand. It's because they say in our literature and 12 step, like if you don't care for somebody or you have a resentment, then you need to pray for them. That's the hardest thing to do is to want something good for you when I can't stand you. <laughs> but I don't want to feel bad today. And it makes me feel bad to treat you badly because I start getting restless and irritable. And then I'm like, if I'm, I'm all these miserable things. I might as well just drink. So let me ask you this question. Why is the success rate so low in 12 step program? You know, it used to be like one in three. Maybe it used to be, I think it used to be 50% and like, and it, you know, back in the, I don't know, when we started, the program started in the 30, 39, the, the book first came out, but we, um, you know, we, I don't, I can't answer that, but I do know that addicts don't make it nearly uh, some addicts, depending on the drug, the success rate for specific drug addicts is a lot less than it is for alcoholics, but we just either get it or we don't. And my moment of clarity came and I got a hold of it. And I have buried people that I sponsored. I work, I walked through the 12 steps with them. I carried, you know, the message, if you will. I passed the message on and they died anyway. And I don't know, and there isn't really a scientific answer. There's a in in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I don't ever, you know from our traditions, um, you know, we say that we don't talk about it on press radio or films. We don't break our own anonymity, but I can talk about Alcoholics Anonymous is well known and it was in newspapers years ago. So I can talk about the program at a high level. Anyway, I will. Um, it talks about in our literature, there's the doctor's opinion and that's the first story. It's one of the best stories because there was a doctor who wasn't one of us and his name was Dr. Silkworth and he wrote about it being an allergy. Some people never ever admit some people never get a god some people never find a god some people never really tell the truth 
And that's really what sets us apart. When we do step forward, it asks us to do a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And in that inventory, we're to talk about the things who we harmed, who we were resentful, you know, at or for, you know, a sex inventory. Like that was super hard for me. Like, I'm going to be candid with you guys. It was like, by the time I got to sobriety, it was like guy in horse trailer, guy in black cowboy hat. I mean, like, you know, really nothing to be proud of. Husbands I had hurt, you know, what did I do? You know, what did it impact? My personal self-esteem, my pocketbook, like what did it hurt? And then what could I have done differently? Like, right. It's looking at my part today and the humility has helped drive the growth for me because I want more of this. I decided when I came in, I said earlier, I decided when I came into the rooms of of recovery that a, that it wouldn't fail me and that B, God would not fail me. And even, so you asked me, you know, do I ever think about it or do I ever, I don't think you said the word obsessed, but do I, do I ever think about drinking? Yeah. I mean, like I go to Vegas and I look around and I'm like, yeah, those lights are shiny and it looks fun in here. But then it stinks. People get around me. I've dated men and they get around me and they get to breathe into my face. And I'm just like, I don't want to wake up with cotton mouth or a headache or a hangover. And you know, from somebody who used to sleep in their truck and pass out on the side of the road and get, thankfully I'm not a felon and by the grace of God, um, you know, Emily, I was promoted to vice president two years ago of, 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 of my whole department. And I actually manage a team of people who do what I used to do. And today I try to be a living example of like how God works through me. And I, I ask God constantly, someone asks what I say in the morning to be a channel, like, just let me be a channel for you. And if you don't have a higher power, if it isn't, you know, the carpenter on Jesus on the wall or, or God or whatever, whoever, um, there's something greater than me. When I go to the ocean, it's, it's far bigger than me. I look at the sky. It's far bigger than me. Have a friend whose higher power is faith. She says it's a woman and faith is bigger than her because the world, you know, she's from a science, science background and, you know, we're all different. But when I quit drinking, I decided not that day, but I just decided I didn't want any more at the time being. And then as my life got better and I started feeling better, I lost 50 pounds the first year I was sober. I remember that. And, I mean, I just like lost 50 pounds. And then I started to put it back on because I started having a good time, you know, eating food and chocolate and shoving in the sugar. But you know what? Um, I've had three heart surgeries since I got sober that were successful and there was no anesthesia. Um, unfortunately, because if they used anesthesia then they couldn't find the problem. So it was more electric um, electricity problem. So I've had heart surgeries awake that were very painful. I have had hysterectomy. So the absolution of never having children has happened. Um, I lost two babies. One was pretty far along. Um, some things have happened that, you know, we're not all like glitter in the air. My life is great because I'm in recovery. My job is hard like you guys. I mean, shit happens to be candid and not to be rude. Life is lifey. I don't walk around with glitter in my pockets going like, well, let's hear it for the boy. You know, let's hear it. Yeah, I don't. But there are days where I'm on the spiritual beam. I feel good. I've prayed. I've been of service to other people, whether it's, you know, telling my story or someone calls and I've shared or I, I go chair meetings. I make coffee. I go move things. I do things that, you know, I go spend time with my mom and my mom and I are not like this. And over the years, we've become more like this. But I treat her with respect and dignity because of who I am, not because of who she is. And I want more sobriety because there's so many gifts that have come, you know, and I didn't know I could live this way. Maybe the rest of the world's been living this way. Kind to other people when they don't want to be not smart enough at the checkout line. Don't get me wrong. I think it, I just don't always say it. You know, I'm not flattening tires or keying cars or treating dudes like crap, but I also don't put up with it either. You know, I read those two books I told you about and they changed my life completely changed my life. You've changed a lot of people's lives on this show. And I want to know, would you be willing to come back? A hundred percent. I am happy to talk about a specific topic or a specific area. Um, you know, I can talk about just 
the faith, the humility, the growth, the whatever it is, my thoughts about alcohol. I mean, anything at all. We can compartmentalize or, or we can spread it out. I love it. I would be honored, Emily. I would well, be honored. I was honored to have you. I learned so much from you tonight. And I, I, I love that we do set the stories because I'm supposed to be stepping, but sometimes I get so engrossed that I sit down because I just want to hear like what you have to say. Um, but I, I, I absolutely not only would love to have you come back, but I think you said you might know some people in your circle that would come because a lot of these things you're teaching and talking about, you know, we don't have to be alcoholics to learn from you. Right. You know, I, I think everybody has an addiction in them. I really do. I honestly believe it. If you tell me that you're not addicted to anything, I'm going to call you bluff. Yeah. Because everybody has an addiction in them, whether it's OCD kind of, you know, control over things mm -hmm. or whether it's codependency shop. It doesn't have to be the big four. You know, it doesn't have to be the sex, drugs, gambling, alcohol. It can be anything, anything that takes over your soul. Well, what it is, I think, and I firmly believe is when we're not okay with who we are, we need to change the way we feel. Yes. So with whatever we pick up, use, buy. I go on shopping sprees, guys. I am not always a good, like, little recover, recovery poster child. I'm like, Amazon, buy, buy, buy. Found Sheen or Shine. Found Timu. Buy, buy, buy. You know what? I'm not praying. I'm not reading my literature. I'm not going to meetings. I'm not calling my sponsor. I'm not doing the things that they told me to do to keep me balanced. So, therefore, buy now, buy now, or eat, eat, eat. Or you know what? I have restricted eating as a sexual abuse. I have, I have an eating disorder and I restrict what I eat. You know, it's, it's rare anymore, but all of us change the way we feel by something. You know, some people rage, like, right. Some people love too much and then it's their fault when they don't love them back. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. Somebody, Shelly came on and said, this is so powerful that she has goosebumps all over. And Shelly's not an alcoholic. It, you know what, Shelly? You don't have to be. And I don't know if I even went back to your question. I'm sorry. But, you know, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm Actually, somebody asked me to give a talk um, at a group. I'm happy to share that with you, Emily, if you wanted to put that out there. I, it's coming up next month. So I'll be yeah. in an open meeting and if I, in the colony. If anybody wanted to, you know, come, they could. I, I share it a little differently around, you know, people in person um, just because I can go to a different level, but you know, talk about there's people in our group. And I'm not going to name names, obviously, but sure. we have clients that when they come to us, they basically say, if wine is off the table, this is not a program for me. Now I'm going to ask you a question. My mom said something once to me and it really resonated. She said, I can tell you if you have an alcohol problem, if you're told that you can never have alcohol again, if it makes you feel weird in any kind of sort of way, you got a problem. Like, do you think that if somebody cannot abstain from drinking wine for 30 days, does that mean they have a problem? I think that the problem lies within. It's the choice that they've used wine to anesthetize the problem. So, yes, I wouldn't call them an alcoholic. I would say our book tells us, if you can go to the bar and do controlled drinking, or if you can have one drink, walk away and not think about it at all anymore, which I've seen thousands of people do, and I don't understand it because I'm not wired that way, then you don't have a problem. But if you cannot or will not go without alcohol, you are anesthetizing something and you have a problem. Don't know what it is, but you do have a problem. And maybe it's just the act of having that glass of wine that they have to do. We have people that that will not stop drinking coffee. I don't care. Like one day, 30 days, it's a deal breaker. Dr. Pepper right here. But here's what I'll tell you. There's a payoff to everything we do, good or bad. There's a payoff. And if you take that back and think about it for a minute, I mean, like we, you know what, we, we teach people how to treat us, right? Like what we continue will allow. There's a payoff to staying in relationships, like a familiar sweatshirt with holes in it. We know what to get. There's a payoff to drinking the wine. And here's the, what I'll really, the big takeaway from like, how do you diagnose yourself or what it, it's not what we drink and it's not how much we drink. 
it's why we drink. Why do I drink? Because I like the taste of it. Oh, sure. Did I like the taste of drinking McCormick or Gilby's bottom level bar vodka in double shots? No. But why did I drink? To fill the void because I didn't feel okay with who I was. I couldn't. I had to, I had to shake the day off to be okay. So, you know, if wine's off the table, then that individual isn't ready for your program or for another, you know, and that's too bad. But, um, you know, you can share the message and you can continue to, to be available and maybe you've planted a seed. You know, we can't, you asked me earlier, you know, why don't we all get it? It used to be, and I stopped short, I apologize. It used to be like three back when, the, like 1939, when the literature was written, then it went to like one in five. And now it's like one in eight of us that stay sober. So you when are, I, I didn't realize what a powerful speaker you are. And I feel like I've gotten off the rails, but I love that your questions have taken me off the rails because otherwise sometimes I just go A to Z and there's different questions and there's different feedback. I can't see that your comments, which is good or I'd have been distracted. So I really love this format and I would, I would love to answer questions or talk. And I'm by no stretch some professional. My sponsor has 43 years. She feeds me constantly, soulfully. Somebody says, I'm addicted to carbs, period. That quote your mom said was perfectly. Emily, I'll be re-watching this, y'all. Might have to watch. Uh, might have to keep a, a watch time. I need. Actually, somebody said. Hey. hey. Um, somebody said. Um, it's not. They repeated you. It's not what. It's no. how much you drink. No. It's not how much you drink. It's why you why you're drinking. Um, and everybody just thinks you're amazing. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. And only because of God's grace and one day at a time. You and know you what? Know, you've helped me more than you know. Look, I've got an ad addictive personality, whether it's too much exercise or too much. You know, if I'm going to if I'm going to binge watch something on Netflix, man, I'm going to binge watch it on Netflix. You know, uh, whether it's, um, you know, what there was uh, there was a time in my life where I think I may have had a problem with alcohol. I, I, I think, you know, that I have a neck problem. Yeah. And that alcohol was. I thought was helping the spasms. Well, it was sure. taking more and more and more to help with the spasms. And so I found myself drinking lots of Corona lights at night one summer. Um, and, and actually even considered going into a program. Um, thankfully for me with alcohol, the pleasure of alcohol became zero. So what happened was I wasn't getting even that sort of, what I, whatever, you know, an alcoholic is chasing, like it wasn't happening for me anymore. After I had kids, particularly something kind of changed where the high wasn't high anymore. So that the pain wasn't worth the pleasure at that point. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but like yep. I, you know, so, but I do have an addictive personality and I admit that. Um, and there's several addictions that I've battled throughout my life. Um, but I think we all do. I, I think we all, all of us do. We all do. You know, the thing is, is there's a program for so many things, but it's not necessarily um, needed for everything. Sometimes we just need an outlet or somebody who understands. I think the magic is found when you can confide in someone who gets it. Like when when you feel when you feel validated, you feel less shame. Like I had so much shame. But whenever I talk to a woman who's like, that's all you've done. Wait, hang on. Let me tell you what I did. Then I'm like, I don't feel so bad. You know, I want to show you. I don't know if you can see her. Can you see her? Yes. That's me. Oh. That's when I stopped drinking. I wish I could get it closer. I don't even recognize you. I know. I'll have to send it to you. I'm happy to send it out. I, that's me. I was sick, sad, and sorry. And you know what? I had my neck fixed. I did have my neck fixed um, from the abuse. My headaches stopped. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I went to the Mayo Clinic. I've been sick in sobriety. He's traveling been... the world. I've never seen someone travel as much. Well, you, uh, the, the one thing I know, when you don't have children, you get to travel your ass off and you've done it, girl. And yeah, you... I went, yeah, I went to Antarctica in December. I go to Africa next yeah. month and then Egypt in November. And you know what? I went to Scotland, Ireland earlier two months ago. I traveled nine countries last year, sometimes just weekends, short Caribbean trips. But you know what? 
I am blessed. I've tattoos. Most people wouldn't know it, but I'm tattooed. Nobody sees it at work. And I'm in a dress now, but like I'm tattooed almost stockings from the top to the bottom of my feet. And um, I decided years ago, these are my le- my legs and my feet. And I have walked through fire on these suckers. And I don't care what anybody says. So I have tattoos all over well, <laughs> of my trips helped. and my passport stamps. So you have, helped, yeah. you have helped so many people. And you should be very proud of yourself. No, and thank you. you. Very courageous. And and I will continue to pray for you and, and myself and everyone that's dealing with things of these sorts because it's a problem and we glamorize alcohol a mm-hmm. lot. We glamorize it. We glam, we glamorize alcohol, drugs, gambling, pornography, shopping, all these things we glamorize. And, you know, it's very unfortunate um, that there are so many sick people right now. And the fact that you're helping so many people and you're taking that compulsion to drink and turning it into a compulsion to help. That's it. Is, is, is what you've done. And, um, you know, I've met some other people in 12 step programs that that's exactly what they did. They've taken their compulsion that was for something not good and put it into something that is good. And I think that that is amazing. And I love you and I thank you.